Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Why Christ Had to Die. Mark chapter 8. We come now to the 27th verse. I'm going to read it out of Philip's translation. Philip's, who's a great scholar and who has put the Gospels and the Epistles into very modern English. That was much more like the impact that the truth had on the people when they first heard it. You know, when we read the King James Version, it gives us a totally wrong concept of the way the gospel hit people in the jaw. For the Koine Greek, which means the common language Greek, was written in the language of the day, and it, was, it didn't hit their ears as strange, thou knowest and he doeth, ye generation of vipers, but it hit them like you dirty son of a snake. Uh, on that level, and Phillips has seized this. Now, I'm going to begin to read in the 27th verse. Jesus then went away with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, Who are men saying that I am? John the Baptist, they answered. But others say that you're Elijah, or some say one of the prophets. Then he asked them, But what about you? Who do you say that I am? You are Christ, answered Peter. Then Jesus impressed it upon them that they were not to mention this to anyone. And he began to teach them that it was inevitable that the Son of Man should go through much suffering and be completely repudiated by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He told them all this quite bluntly. And this made Peter draw him to one side and take him to task about what he'd said. But Jesus turned and faced his disciples and rebuked Peter. Out of my way, Satan, he said. Peter, you're not looking at things from God's point of view, but from man's. In the last verses of this chapter, the hard teaching of all that comes here is Jesus' declaration that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die and that he must rise again. First, let me point out in passing, by the way, that this was said, by the way, in verse 27. They were talking. They were walking along a road. They were going to King Philip town, Caesar Philip town, Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Caesar, Philippi, Philip, the father of Alexander the Great. It had been named for him, and they were walking along the road. And by the way, the Lord Jesus began to talk to them. Isn't it wonderful to have such intimacy with the Lord Jesus that you can talk with him by the way? I, I would like to impress upon you the wonderful glory and joy of living in such a way that the Lord is in every part of your conversation, that you know he's there when you tell jokes, that you know that he's there when you talk about food and everything that there is round about. When you walk in your garden, when you look at a rose, when you read the Bible, of course, and when you talk about spiritual things, but that you can talk to him at any moment. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Lord, how wonderful for you to have made so much beauty. Uh, he may make you uncomfortable out about some of the things you do, and immediately you'll switch. And this is one of the important things, because it is the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes you uncomfortable about some things, and you learn to say no to yourself in order that you may say yes with him, because everything is being lived in this level. So he came and spake to them, by the way. Now, he started by asking them a question. What's the common gossip about me? What are people saying about me? You're out mingling with the crowd. Who do they say that I am? Well, some say John the Baptist. John had just had his head cut off. And, of course, John had been so famous and had made such a tremendous splash in the publicity of Palestine, that everybody was talking about him and everybody knew that he'd had his head cut off and now Jesus is rising and is performing miracles and healing people and some people say, well, you see, old Herod cut his head off, but he's back to life. Now this is John the Baptist back over again. The devil's viewpoint says that this is one of the proofs that the people in that day believed in transmigration of the soul, in reincarnation, and that the people thought that Jesus was a reincarnation of John the Baptist. But this does not follow, and the Bible does not teach any such thing, and the Bible teaches the contrary. And moreover, we'll see in a moment that what the confused ideas of these people, even if they did think it, it is no sign that there was such a truthful thing, 
but rather, on the contrary, that it's one more measure of the utter depravity of their thinking and the nonsense of it. Because to think that Jesus was John the Baptist was to misconceive what John the Baptist was and what Jesus was. And some said Elijah, and some said one of the prophets. Now, you see, Elijah and his methods were so far removed from the Lord's ways. And John the Baptist and his methods were so far removed from the Lord's ways. And this is true of the prophets. Now, these men were human beings, and they taught, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they moved and taught and worked each prophet in his own sphere and John the Baptist in his sphere. But they were men, fallible men. And John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus himself, brought out the contrast between the two of them when he said John came as a vigorous desert figure and he came fasting and he came with a message of thunder and I, I've come eating and drinking and I've come with the message of love and compassion. And they had totally failed to understand the nature of who he was. For this was God. And therefore, for people to think that he was John the Baptist or Elijah was not only a sin, it was a blasphemy. It was a thing for which men could be ultimately separated from God forever. It wasn't good for them to be thinking, oh, he's great prophet, when this was the Lord God Almighty. Now, I want you to notice that it was in this framework that the Lord Jesus Christ turned around and said, I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem and die and rise again. Why? Well, anybody that could think he was nothing more than Elijah or John the Baptist could think of killing him. They'd cut off John the Baptist's head, they'd be ready to kill him. Here was the great watershed between the thinking of those who did not know and the thinking of those who knew. And what the Lord is telling these men you have taken an opinion totally the contrary to that of the world. Whom say ye that I am? Peter said, you're Christ, Messiah. Now, this same distinction is in Philadelphia today. And believe me, if you face, are face to face with religious people in Philadelphia with the ideas that we have and the ideas that they have, they must ultimately come into collision. There is no common ground between us and those who do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. I tell you, dear friends, that the opposition is right here in the religion of the United States versus Christianity. For the religion of the United States today is, oh, God is good, God is love, all men are brothers, brotherhood. This is the time for the first place on earth where in America, God bless America, why everything is wonderful and all men are equal and all men are brothers. Well, someone says, don't you believe that? Not only do I not believe it, but with all the force of my being, I fight against it and say that it is from the devil. Now, how did these questions and their answers serve as an introduction to the announcement of Christ? Alexander McLaren has a paragraph on this that is very interesting, and I know of no better way to express it. All this conversation, whom do you say that I am? Whom do they say that I am? And how did this introduce the fact that immediately Jesus said, I must go and die? These questions and answers brought clearly before the disciples the hard fact of Christ's rejection by the popular voice and defined their own position as sharply antagonistic. If his claims were thus unanimously tossed aside, a collision must come, a rejected Messiah could not fail to be, sooner or later, a slain Messiah. And then, clear, firm faith in his Messiahship was needed in order to enable them to stand the ordeal which the announcement, and still more its fulfillment, would subject them. A suffering Messiah might be a rude shock to all their dreams, but a suffering Jesus, who was not Messiah, would have been the end of their discipleship and again, the significance of the worth of the cross could only be understood when seen in the light of the great confession, Thou art the Christ. Even as now, today, we must believe that he who died was the Son of the living God before we can see what that death was and what that death did. For an imperfect concept of who Jesus is 
takes all the meaning and the power out of his death and out of his life. Most of all, it takes the meaning and power out of his life, but most of all, it impoverishes the infinite preciousness of his death. For if Jesus were nothing more than John the Baptist or Elijah, come back, or if he's nothing more than a nice example or the giver of a good sermon on the mount and a teacher of ethics, then let's face it, we have no Christianity. But if he's God, then he must die. And we will see that we must die with him. Now, he then announces the cross. Whom say men that I am? They say that? Well, well, whom do you say that I am? The Messiah? I, I might as well tell them. I must die. You know, as I read the life of the Lord Jesus in the Gospels, I realize that always before him he knew he must die. And I, as I was preparing this message, I ran my mind over the Gospels, and I thought that when he was a boy, he knew he must die. I remembered the painting of Holman Hunt where he shows the boy Jesus, 12 or 13 years of age, in the carpenter shop, and he's tired for a moment, and he stands this way by the open door, and as he does so, the sun behind him casts a cross of his shadow across the shavings. And there he was in the carpenter shop with the shadow of the cross in front of him. And that shadow of the cross was always in front of him. And how this heightens everything that he ever did and everything that he ever said. As he fed the 5,000, he was thinking, I'm, I'm giving food to sustain the people that are going to murder me. I wouldn't put it past the man of whom we spoke a week or two ago, who, where he spat and touched the cord of the man's tongue, I wouldn't put it past that man whose tongue was loosed that he later used that tongue to cry, crucify him. For the Bible says they all left him. And everything the Lord did was with the thought, I must die. He reached out his hand to lepers. He touched them. And they came back to cleansing. And he was thinking, I must die. He, he gave sight to the blind. And as they opened to see him, he, he's saying, I must die. For he knew that what he was doing was dependent upon what he was going to do. Christ must suffer, he said. Well, why must? Must. Now, this imperative was all through the life of Christ. When I came to this point in my preparation, I took a concordance and looked up the word must. And I read every verse in the Gospels that has the word must in it. And it's an impressive list of the things that Jesus said must. In Matthew 16, he must go to Jerusalem. In Matthew 26, I could call 12 legions of angels, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? In Mark 8, the Son of Man must suffer many things. And in Mark 9, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be set at naught. Back in his babyhood, he had said, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? In Luke 4, I must preach to other cities also, for therefore am I come. In Luke 9, the Son of Man must suffer many things. In Luke 13, I must walk today and tomorrow and the following day. You know how you read and you read and read, I had read this probably several hundred times, but I never really saw it till yesterday. If someone had said to me, where's the reverse in the Bible that says Jesus said I must walk today, tomorrow, and the next day? I'd say, I, I don't remember such a verse, but I found it last night, and it's there. It was the week before he was going to die, and, and he was walking, and he was walking, and he was walking, and somebody stopped him and said, don't go to Jerusalem. Herod set a trap to kill you. And Jesus said, I must walk today and tomorrow, and the day following, and then my hour will come. I must, I must. In Luke 17, first must suffer many things. In Luke 19, he's preaching, and Zacchaeus is in a tree, and he said, come down, I must abide in thy house. And I began to see that his must, must applied to me, that he had something for us. In Luke 22, this is written, that this is written must yet be accomplished in me. The Son of Man must be delivered. All things must be fulfilled. The Son of Man must be lifted up as the serpent was. Even so, the Son of Man must. And I, I thought of Zacchaeus up on the tree, and I, in the fourth of John, I came to the place where it says, Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Why? Well, the woman at the well was there, and he was going to save her in that town. He must lodge in our house. 
Oh, that imperative, that divine imperative that takes you and that takes me. And he had to go to the cross and he had to die. And all the time there was upon him this because he was the Christ and because he was God, the Word made flesh. I must work the works of him that sent me, for the night cometh when no man can work. Other sheep have I which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. How sayest thou, they said to him, that the Son of Man be, must be lifted up? Now, you see, this imperious necessity was not because of man. Jesus did not say, I must be killed because men are going to kill me. The Lord did not have to allow himself to be put to death. In fact, Jesus flatly said, No man taketh my life from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up. He could have stopped this if he had wished, but thank God he did not wish to stop it. There was none other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. And this great must ruled his life, and this must was a cable of two strands, obedience to the Father and love to man. That's why he must. I do that which is well-pleasing to the Father, then I must die and pay the price of sin. I love the world, then I must die, for there is no other way. And this is the cord. You might say the two parts of the harness that drew him, obedience to God and love for you and for me, I must and he took on this harness, and that it was which drew him to Jerusalem, and that it was which drew him to the cross, and that was what fastened him there, not the nails. It was love that drew him there to be a sacrifice for you and me. His desire was to save, and therefore he must die. Now that must also, if you look closely at our text, that must goes beyond the tomb. The Son of Man must die and rise again. He must rise. Why? The vindication by God of all that he was claiming. He must rise. Now they didn't understand this, but we do. They didn't know that Jesus was going to die and rise again. Even to them it was a candle in the fog, but to us it's a sun in a blue sky. They didn't understand, for in fact this very, very message that Jesus gave to them that day the Son of Man must die and rise again. Do you know they forgot it? The proof that they forgot it is found in several places. In John chapter 20 and verse 9, when Jesus rose from the dead, they were in a dither around Jerusalem, and it says, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And in Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, they came, and Jesus said, D Didn't you have any faith? They said, well, we left Jerusalem this morning, and some of them said the tomb was empty. They came back with a, a tale about resurrection. But Cleopas said, come on, let's get going. It's a long way back to Emmaus. They'd forgotten. And if you turn back to John 2, verse 22, when Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it again, and he was talking about the resurrection, this is what John 2 says. When he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture. That's extremely important. When the disciples, after the resurrection, they remembered. Oh, what hope this is. The Lord plants some truth in our hearts, and it doesn't hatch for a long time afterward. There's so many instances of truth that has been put in the mind of a child, and the child goes halfway to the devil, and then the Lord hatches out the truth. You have this in so many cases. John Newton, his mother taught him the verses up till he was five. Put the, the eggs in his heart and went off and there was the truth. And John Newton went all the way to slavery and drunkenness and misery in Africa. Then God saved him and he became a force and a power. This is our hope. This is our expectation that God will thus work. But they didn't understand. I must die. And then the Lord Jesus Christ rebuked Peter because Peter came with this terrible, strange idea that death isn't necessary, that crucifixion is not necessary. For if he must die, then there comes to us what he is now going to say in the rest, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow him.
This is so vast a subject that it can't be treated in the one moment. But if you take it all in outline, it is simply this. Who am I? And if you have any less opinion, you put Christ to death. Where the world walks popularly was not the voice of God. The voice of the people was the voice of the devil. And when they cried, oh, this is Elijah, this is a prophet, he's a good man, he's this, he's this. They were putting themselves in an antagonism. But we who have taken the position, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. We then make a commitment to him. And the minute we do, we are drawn with these same cords. We're put in the same harness. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And yoked with him, we must be drawn to the cross. In this world, you shall have tribulation. And if any of you are seeking a good time and an easy way and a light Christianity, I wonder if you're saved. And I say give diligence to make your calling and election sure. And I call you most earnestly to seeing the tremendous implications of the fact that we are committed to Jesus Christ, Jehovah God, as that which ties us with him in his hatred by the world. He said it in John, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world and I have elected you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So I'm calling you to a life of association with Jesus Christ that you take your stand boldly against popular opinion in the United States, against cheap religion, against the sleazy idea that God can be taken into your business and you're sure of good dividends if you hold right thoughts and that everything is just lovely if you think positively and are a nice creature. All of this is alien to the truth of the cross. I must die. I must rise again. And this we must say with him.